This is Dr. Scott Nelson from the International Limb Lengthening Institute at Loma Linda University. I will be demonstrating the surgical technique for placing a trochanteric entry precise magnetic lengthening nail in the femur. One of the most important aspects of this operation is preoperative planning. Standing, full length, AP and lateral lower extremity x-rays are taken on our EOS scanner. If there's any abnormality in the mechanical axis deviation, also known as the MAD, then joint line orientation angles are checked to localize the deformities that may need to be addressed in the operation. The length of each femur, as well as the length of each tibia, is measured. Foot height difference is then assessed as it can be a significant contributor to congenital leg length discrepancies. For skeletally immature patients, these segmental lengths are then recorded in our spreadsheet to calculate predicted limb length discrepancies. In order to confirm the validity of these measurements, it's important to look for joint contractures which would affect the segmental differences as measured on the AP x-ray. Our patient had a previous 50 millimeter lengthening of his left tibia, which is also recorded in the spreadsheet, as this affects the predicted limb length discrepancy. In order to request the proper nail size ahead of time, the x-ray is measured for nail sizing. The diameter of the nail is determined by measuring the outer diameter of the narrowest portion of the mid-diaphysis. The inner canal diameter is less important as it is typically enlarged with reamers, so we measure the outer diameter and subtract 7 millimeters to determine maximum allowable reaming diameter. This leaves a circumferential cortex that is 3.5 millimeters thick and preferably we leave even a bit more than that. In our case, the external bone diameter measures 20 millimeters, limiting us to a maximum reaming diameter of 13 millimeters. It is necessary to ream at least two millimeters larger than the nail. This is because the nail is straight and we want it to slide in easily in order to avoid damage to the gear shaft and to allow lengthening to occur without restraint. So for this case, we ordered a 10.7 millimeter nail diameter. The desired length of the nail is then assessed by measuring from the tip of the greater trochanter down into the distal diaphysis. In most cases, it is desirable to use a significantly shorter nail than what would typically be used for a trauma case. Again, this is because we are placing a straight nail into a curved femur and we want to avoid friction. This patient with congenital femoral deficiency as well as fibular hemimelia is skeletally immature and has the majority of his discrepancy in the femoral segment. Thus, we chose a trochanteric entry femoral nail. The patient is placed supine on a radiolucent table. The ipsilateral upper extremity is positioned over the chest and the entire lower extremity as well as the hip and torso area are prepped and draped in a sterile fashion. Additional instrument trays have been necessary in the past for the proper entry point instrumentation as well as to perform flexible intramedullary reaming. More recently, the company has included most of these instruments in their own instrument trays. The bony landmarks are palpated, the greater trochanter is marked, and an entry point in the skin, approximately five centimeters proximal to this, is established. It is not necessary to make the entry incision more than about 2 to 3 centimeters in length for most cases. The dissection is carried down to the greater trochanter and a guide pin is placed into the tip of the trochanter. In this patient, we are planning to use a 10.7 millimeter diameter nail and thus a 13 millimeter entry reamer is used. A 3.5 to 4 millimeter drill bit is then used to percutaneously perforate the femur at the planned level of corticotomy. I typically place at least one perforation in the lateral cortex and three in the medial cortex. This decompresses the femoral canal during reaming and prevents fat embolism. Also, these perforations provide an exit site for the reamings, which essentially fertilize the corticotomy leaving a very satisfying cloud of reaming material, which can be seen even on x-ray. This is usually done five to seven centimeters distal to the lesser trochanter, but may be influenced by sagittal or coronal plane deformity. If it is done too proximal, varus deformity can be created. If it is too distal, then it can be difficult to insert the nail. 
It is essential that adequate coverage of the distal bone segment be maintained on the thick portion of the nail for stability after lengthening. I usually plan to have at least two centimeters of overlap between this distal segment of bone and the thick part of the nail. The ball tipped guide wire is then placed into the medullary canal and the length of the bone is then confirmed. I like to place the measuring guide beside the guide wire rather than over the top of it as it is easier and it doesn't have the tendency to fall into the entry hole. Flexible reamers are then sequentially placed over the guide wire. Once diameter is confirmed, the implant is opened and loaded on the insertion device. It is important to confirm the alignment of the proximal interlock cannulas before placing the nail into the patient. There is very little margin for error with this device as the size of the interlocking peg has been maximized and the interlock screws must be placed very accurately. After advancing the implant into the proximal aspect of the femoral canal, a robust derotation guide wire is placed just anterior or posterior to the nail in the proximal segment. A second one is placed in the distal segment, distal to the planned location of the tip of the implant. The corticotomy is then completed with a half or quarter inch osteotome and the nail advanced into its final position. It is very important to confirm that the osteotomy is complete. The proximal interlock pegs are then placed using the insertion jig. It is important to note that these interlock pegs have an inner thread in the screw head which should be attached to the screwdriver for ease of placement. In this case, we desired to internally rotate the femur by 15 degrees, and this is assessed using the rotational guide pins and a sterile goniometer. The surgical assistant then maintains this position while freehand technique using perfect circles with fluoroscopic guidance is used to place the distal interlock pegs. Although it is possible to place three distal interlocks in this nail, it is usually only necessary to use two of these. Typically, these two are placed lateral to medial through a single incision. It is important to round up the length needed for the interlock pegs to provide maximal fixation. Sometimes gentle pressure needs to be applied to initiate the screw threads into the lateral cortex. Note that the peg should slide into the bone and across the interlock hole and then only require a minimal number of turns before it is fully seated. Iliotibial band release is performed in the majority of congenital leg length discrepancy cases as well as any cases that have any knee instability and or iliotibial band tightness. In cases of stature lengthening and post-traumatic lengthenings of less than 5 cm, it can sometimes be avoided. This transverse release of the fascia lata and intermuscular septum is usually done through a mid-lateral incision just proximal to the level of the superior pole of the patella. If done more proximally, then an unsightly muscle herniation can occur. The final step of this operation is to localize the magnet under fluoroscopic guidance. This is marked with an indelible marker on the anterior portion of the thigh. The patient must maintain the integrity of this mark throughout their lengthening process. The external remote control is then placed in a sterile bag and the first 1 to 2 millimeters of lengthening is performed prior to awakening the patient. A magnified view of the lengthening gear is obtained before and after this lengthening in order to confirm communication between the remote control and the internal lengthening mechanism of the nail. A cosmetic closure is then performed with absorbable subcutaneous sutures and sterile dressings are applied. Although more recent experience shows that it may not be necessary, we typically use a latency period of five to seven days prior to initiating the lengthening process. We program the remote control for one millimeter of lengthening per day, which is divided into three or four segments. The patient is kept non-weight bearing during the distraction phase until the regenerate begins to mature and more weight bearing can be allowed. Postoperative visits are scheduled every two weeks during the lengthening phase. X-rays are carefully examined for regenerate formation at each visit. The length of the device is also carefully measured to assure that the predicted amount of lengthening is occurring.
It is also important to assess hip and knee joints proximal and distal to the lengthening for any subluxation or dislocation. Range of motion of the knee and hip is also carefully assessed at each postoperative visit. Physical therapy is prescribed five days a week for all femoral lengthenings and the insurance approval process for this is completed prior to the operation in order to avoid unnecessary delays. Any questions or comments about this procedure can be directed to me at my email or on our website. Thank you.